Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our JCU webinar series. Tonight we're joined by JCU PhD student and Queensland Police Service Senior Sergeant Jim Whitehead to discover how he's using Queensland homicide cases to develop a system of statistical analysis that may help bring closure to grieving families and assist in securing a conviction. My name is James Stewart and I'll be moderating the webinar this evening. I want to start off by acknowledging the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of this country and pay my respects to the traditional owners and elders past and present of the land on which we stand today. In the spirit of reconciliation, I also acknowledge the valuable contribution that Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to make to James Cook University and the broader community. And finally, some housekeeping before we get the webinar started. Um, if you do have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel and I'll raise the questions with Jim as appropriate. So I'll let you get started now, Jim, thanks. Uh, thank you. There we go. Um, yes, thank you. Um, James did allude that I am a PhD student as well as a senior sergeant for the Queensland Police Force. And uh, what we're trying to do is um, look at homicides and see if we can determine if there's any uh, trends or characteristics within the disposal of homicide victims that might assist us to uh, look for victims in the future. So that's the basis of my PhD. And so far, it's been a, a five year journey. Um, not without its issues, but uh, it's been quite enjoyable overall. So why have I undertaken this study? Initially, it was basically just to fill in a gap in our search and rescue knowledge. So I'll take you back a little bit to, uh, to set the scene as to why it's important for us to look for undiscovered homicide victims. Now, my day-to-day -day job is looking for lost and missing people uh, from land environment, a maritime environment, or an aviation environment. And uh, I, I, that's all I do within the police service. And uh, over an average year, we find about 2,000 people have been lost or misplaced. Um, that also includes people with dementia, uh, runaways, people who are suicidal, and uh, people who fall off boats or boats collapse, capsize, hit rocks, and that sort of stuff. So it's a fairly busy uh, occupation within the service and uh, on average we do about 3.2 search and rescue incidents a day. Um, as well as that we often get asked to assist with evidence searching but uh, I'll just set the scene where SAR comes from for those of you who've never had any dealings with search and rescue at all and and most people thankfully never get lost so it's a um, probably a, an area of policing that uh, most people don't realise that we actually do. But it's the United Nations function and the national Australia, we actually signed a couple of conventions, uh, the Solace Convention in 1949 and the Chicago Convention in 1944, which actually said that uh, if you go lost within the Australian search and rescue region, that uh, we will come and find you. Now, the police aren't the only SAR assets or uh, authorities in Australia. We also have the uh, Joint Rescue Coordination Centre in Canberra, which is part of the Australian Maritime Safety Authority and the Australian Defence Force. But uh, for land situations and homicides particularly, um, it is the police who are the forefront of doing search and rescue. If uh, we're only looking at Queensland, by the way, because uh, I did initially start this for Australia wide, but there were some issues with gathering data from the other states. So uh, working within the service, it was far easier for me to gather Queensland data. But a, a snappy uh, view of what we do there, you can see we do about 1,200 to 1,400 SAR incidents a year. And uh, as you can see, maritime ones are about twice as many land ones. Um, there used to be a fairly large gap between them, but over the years, they're slowly closing now, and aviation incidents are relatively few in number, thankfully. Um, all our searching information is contained within our national SAR manual, so we're actually really good at looking for responsive people, those people who want to be found. We're really good at looking for unresponsive people, those people who have perished through their time frame for survival, uh, finishing the uh, the conditions of the environment they're in, overcoming them, people who drown in the water, uh, suicidal people, even sometimes the odd clandestine grave we, uh, we actually come across. So we have set rules for that and they're all contained within the National Search and Rescue Manual. Um, if we're looking for a person and uh, my whole uh, basis of my PhD is around homicide victims on land because generally if they're in the ocean there's very very little chance of us actually finding them um, which is pretty much the same as if people fall overboard if we don't find you generally in the first 24 hours we uh, we don't have much of a chance of finding you but um, for doing land search there as you can see on the screen we have four 
strategies which we use and they're overlaid. We don't use any of them individually. And uh, the first one is theoretically based on how far you could actually walk in the given time frame and the particular environment you're in. Statistical is our lost person behavior. And that's where it starts to tie into the PhD study that I'm doing now. Um, we have an, an ongoing Australian lost person database, uh, which is not the same one as the um, AFP do for people who are reported missing. These are people who have been lost and have been found. So uh, we can work out statistically what they do, uh, characteristics, trends, and uh, it helps us determine how to best search for them. Subjectively is basically looking at the lay of the land. And uh, if you're in a mountainous area, then generally you um, are limited in the amount of walking you can do. And uh, the terrain does... Uh, drive you in particular direction. So that is very dependent upon how well our SAR coordinators can, can read a map or interpret a map. And deductive is basically the Sherlock Holmes of it all, looking at the facts and try and determine what a missing or lost person would do to assist themselves and to assist us in finding them. And as I said, we use all four of these strategies, one on top of the other. And normally what comes out of it is an area that would be the highest area of probability and uh, it could uh, withstand some scrutiny if needed to at some further stage in, uh, in the future. What we end up with is uh, in the statistical one, which is where our um, homicide victims come in, is that because we've looked at almost every land search incident in Australia since 2010, we can determine what most people do in most categories. And it's a, a thing I suppose about humanity that regardless of where we come from or who we are, we all tend to follow the same sort of patterns um, with a very, very few uh, variations. So this page you can see now is, uh, is within the manual and it relates to children that are one to three years old. And uh, we look at some of the characteristics there and those of you who have ever had children will, will accept the fact that they have no concept of being lost and they have very limited navigational skills. Um, wander aimlessly, but uh, we found lately that there have been some studies that show that little kids actually have a plan in their head that just as adults, we generally can't see it. Don't respond to commands or whistles, and we know children don't often do that. Tendencies, as you can see, this is what's happened in a lot of cases. They do seek out places of shelter. They are difficult to detect because of their size and will often rarely walk out or self-help. And for our strategies, this is how we, we come to the response to be able to uh, locate them. It's an urgent response. As we know, children of uh, between one and three don't survive very long in the uh, wilderness, and particularly if there's any water around. Um, confinement is a low priority because kids don't often go that far. And we can see passive techniques don't work. Dogs, particularly police dogs, can be useful if they're used quickly enough. And uh, if we can make checks of the highest probability initially, then we have a greater chance of finding them. And uh, the second last category there is where they're located statistically. And uh, most kids one to three are found within a building of some sort. And sadly, there is a small percentage that are found near water. Um, and the interesting part about our lost person behavior stats is the, the percentages across the bottom there. You can see that 80% of kids in this age group are found within two kilometers of where they're last seen. Now, what I'm trying to do is do a very similar thing to this but with the disposal of homicide victims. Now, over the years, we've been increasingly requested to assist in evidentiary searches to support homicides and major crime groups. And for things like bullet casings, uh, weapons, and that sort of stuff, we are very, very good at doing those sort of searches and turn up a lot of information and, and evidence can, can be useful later on in, a, uh, in an investigation. Unfortunately, there's no equivalent dead person behaviour studies database from which we can use to find undiscovered homicide victims. And uh, that's the tenet of the, the whole uh, PhD that I'm trying to do. If we look at homicide stats in its broadest terms, and I've only done this since 2004, because that's when uh, we actually started putting all our data on a computer prior to that, it was all paper-based. We, we looked at about, uh, in Queensland, about 19% of all the homicides. So even though I've only picked Queensland to do my study, it's a relatively good representation of what occurs in the other states in Australia. Um, homicide over the last few years, it's uh, gradually decreased, despite what you would hear on the news. It seems like there's a homicide every night, but it's been going down, down, down until about 2017, and now we're starting a small slide upwards. Um, is that good? Well, having no homicides would obviously be ideal, but uh, on the other token, having homicides, I, I suppose, is a reflection of the way we live in our society. 
we have about 245 homicides a year annually in Australia. Uh, Queensland has about 54, give or take one or two. And uh, that in itself is not a huge number when you look at other countries overseas. Um, there are cities in the United States that actually have more homicides annually than we do as a, an entire country. But again, that reflects the way their society operates over there. But the most interesting thing about the homicide stats from my point of view is that there are between five and 10 or five and 12, depending on the year, or victims that aren't actually discovered at the scene where they were murdered. And uh, this is where my interest comes in to find those victims. Now, um, it's often been noted that five to 12 people a year is not a big number. So why are we worried about doing this for? Well, those five to 12 people belong to some families. And it's uh, having spoken to some of the families involved there, not knowing is, is very, very cruel on families. And uh, if we can find a person or the remains of a person, then it allows them to uh, grieve a little bit better and allows the justice system function a little bit better as well. So very small numbers, but in the stream of things, I think it's in a very important part of our society that we actually find all these victims and uh, can return them to their families for uh, decent burial and honouring. So the aim of the whole project is to develop a deceased victim behaviour strategy tool for analysis. And as I said before, the good thing is that humans tend to do the same things under the same stresses. And uh, if we could come up with a tool, obviously it will never be an exact tool because uh, nothing in search and rescue is exact. It may actually give our search and rescue coordinators um, an idea of where to, where to search. And uh, may also suggest a lot of areas that aren't worth searching because no one's ever been disposed of in those areas. Uh, a side issue to that, I, I have been um, asked before, if I do this research and publish it, which it would be eventually, is that going to assist criminals in being able to dispose of victims in places that we would never look? And uh, I look at it and say, well, yeah, possibly that could be the case, but I don't think many criminals actually are similar to a Dr. Evil who is stroking a cat coming up with this super plan to foil the police. I think most homicides are basically... Um, as a result of an incident that got out of control. Some are perhaps planned to a certain degree, but uh, no one's gone to the extent of uh, planning on how to dispose of a body, which is uh, incredibly hard to do. So why undertake the study? Initially, it was just about the numbers. And uh, if I could look at the homicides and determine where best to look, that was as far as I was going, but it didn't have much meat in the uh, for a, a PhD doing that. So I looked a little bit further into it and I thought, what are the benefits of us doing this sort of a study? And the first one is it removes the not knowing for the relatives and friends and allows for closure and grieving. Uh, having spoken to, as I said before, several families of um, homicide victims there, it's the not knowing that really is the um, the killing point, I suppose, for a bad word, choice of words, but it's a, uh, it's the hardest thing for a family to get over. Um, you can't complete the cycle of grief if you have nothing to grieve for. And uh, there's always the hope, I suppose, that that loved one could come walking through the door one day and it would all be over. Although realistically, uh, in most cases, that's not the case. Um, it's also a little bit strange that when I was looking at all the, uh, all the data there, closure for Australians or Australians as I can figure it is, uh, is much about being able to bury a loved one, to have something to mourn, whereas closure for the Northern Hemisphere, particularly the USA and the UK, is more about the punishment for the offender. Now, don't get me wrong, there are people who uh, obviously would like to see the offenders punished, but it's not the primary concern. It's more or less or bringing a loved one home so that the cycle of grief can be completed. And uh, if we could do that, even if we only do one person, that's one person that is located and brought home. Jim, we did have a question that, yeah. that, that came through, yeah. if I can ask that now. Yes. Um, so Olivia's asked uh, that she said she's done a lot of uh, thinking on the Peter Falconio case. Yes. Uh, do you think that in the future, your research could assist in finding his body? Um, and as you say, there's no closure for the family all these years on. Um, Peter Falconio is probably the pinnacle of this study. If we could go and find Peter wherever he was buried, um, I reckon that would be the, the proof in the pudding and... Uh, that would that would make this whole thing worthwhile. But it's not just Peter, I suppose, it's every one of the victims that have disappeared over the years in a homicide situation. And I know Australia's a big land, but uh, you know, he wouldn't have been taken 
all that far, I don't think. It's very hard to uh, to dispose of a body, and it's probably very incriminating if you have a body in the boot while you're trying to work out how to dispose of it. So I'm hoping this will give a better idea of where to search and probably more importantly, where not to search. But yeah, I agree. If we could find Peter Falconio, that would be absolutely um, a stunning result, not just for us, but uh, for his family as well. Um, the second reason I thought about this study was the amount of scientific and uh, evidence that you can find at the scene of the crime or where the victim is. Um, knowing where they were murdered is fine, but actually having a body to uh, do a post-mortem on to look at all the uh, evidence that is found on the body is a uh, vital assistance to the investigating police. And it, it puts us at a, behind the eight ball when we actually don't have anything to study, to prove, to um, try and get evidence to convict somebody. So finding a victim obviously finds a lot of evidence as well. The third part is it actually removes the necessity of the prosecution to prove that the victim is in fact deceased. And uh, if you think about it, without having a body, it's incredibly hard to prove to someone that uh, I don't exist anymore. Uh, there are many means of doing it, but it is very hard to do to a, a, the extent of a criminal court, which is beyond the uh, um, chances of probability. Um, obviously, we use uh, social media, we use bank accounts, we use uh, CCTV footage. We looked at their lifestyles and the fact that no one's seen them all in the past, but there's still, uh, I suppose, that small uh, percentage of times where people fake their disappearance, where uh, people just want to drop out of society and go off the grid. Um, but without a, uh, without a body, it is extremely hard to do. It doesn't say it's never been done because it has, but it just means that there's a necessity on the prosecution or the onus on the prosecution is, is so much more. And not only just proving that the person is dead, but also that a particular person caused their death is, is far greater when you don't have the body to uh, link the pieces together. And the last part I thought is, um, you know, a, a successful prosecution obviously uh, contributes to community safety and with that flows confidence in the police service and it's a you know at the moment Queensland police run fairly high as far as confidence goes but it only takes a few cases where we haven't been able to solve them for the community to think that uh, we, we don't have the ability to do our job so undertaking this study has a lot of effects through a lot of ranges in society not just for search coordinators it um, it allows us to to move forward in a lot of things particularly with grieving and uh, the prosecution system. Jim, we have another question come through. Yep. Um, so Karen's asked, from the national homicide statistics per year in Australia, did you have a number just for far north Queensland? Uh, not off the top of my head. Um, they don't break it down too much as far as uh, that goes. They, they collect a lot of information, particularly the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the Australian Homicide Monitoring Program, um, but it's generally not broken down into anything bar states. Um, it could be because uh, most of the data is not identifiable, so you can't actually tell who the individual person is. So uh, it could be done, but it would take a little bit of time uh, to do that. I suppose I've had the benefit in that when I went, undertook this study to gather the data, I was able to use the actual homicide incidents. And uh, even though most of my data is uh, non-identifiable, it has no name or anything attached to it, um, it wouldn't be that hard to, uh, particularly in Queensland, I suppose, to go through the, the newspapers and, and uh, social media to find out who was who in any particular instance. The second thing, as, as I was doing my, uh, my study there, there are a lot of cases where um, people have studied the disposal of homicide victims, not from the extent where I'm trying to work out where they put them, but mostly from uh, the extent of, of uh, if we find a victim, how can we work out who the killer is? So I suppose it's it's profile, a criminal profile, as you would see on TV. I'm, I'm doing it the other way around, that we have uh, a homicide, so where is the victim? But most of the subsets within the, the homicide that uh, I've found uh, are really small, and most of them are around uh, sexual serial killing which is not all that prevalent in Australia. Yes, we do have rapes and murders, but um, we've only ever had 32 serial killers in the, the entire uh, history of um, Australia as a nation. So it's not that many. Whereas uh, some countries like the USA, the FBI believes they may have anywhere up to 160 serial killers active at any one time. So for us, it's a very small area. And uh, I've looked at the 
through the data there, there's no previous studies aimed at locating deceased victims of crime that cover all categories of homicide. So I haven't singled out any particular category. Uh, every homicide has been included in our data sets. So um, murder suicides, murders as a, a part of a uh, domestic violence scene, uh, bikey murders, those sort of things, they're all included in this study. And uh, as you can see there, Lundgren and Cantor identified the, the basic premise behind our lost person database and, and the, that there are identifiable patterns in victim disposal within homicide incidents. But this is a first in that we're actually looking at who did the killing to try and find out where they would have disposed of a body as opposed to the other way around. I found 25 successful homicide convictions without a body in Australia. I, I believe there are a couple more, but um, they're extremely hard to find uh, within the databases because we don't keep data on this sort of stuff, or well, not easily. So there's a few there. Um, there are a lot more incidents, obviously, where a conviction was uh, either not tried for, i.e. that uh, they never arrested anybody or took them to court because there was insufficient evidence or they were acquitted because the evidence didn't point to it. But um, the very fact we've had 25 successful convictions is, uh, I suppose, a testament to the way our justice system does work, but it's also a testament to how, um, how much work police have to do to try and prove that all these people are actually dead when uh, we've found the bodies of none of them. Um, when you compare us to other places like the USA, uh, they just top over 400 successful convictions for no body homicides um, with a population that is far, far greater than us. Um, perhaps our justice system is a little bit more uh, liberal in allowing juries to, to look at that. Um, I'm not sure. So all the data that I did gather came from individual homicide reports. And uh, so that meant uh, reading the whole 729 homicides we've had since 2004 and taking out a small bit of information in there. As I said earlier, it's all non-identifiable because I, I'm not actually interested in the person. I'm interested in what was done to each of the victims. And uh, it might sound a little bit callous, I suppose, but uh, to provide the data in, a, in a, um, a scientific manner, I suppose, it has to be looked at uh, with a, a, a cold eye. Um, I did go through the Australian Bureau of Statistics data and the National Homicide Monitoring Program data, but that's generally always outdated because it sometimes takes up to two years for each individual police service to provide the information to the groups. So things I was looking for, obviously the incident number. Um, so we didn't get duplication in the system and the actual data at the very end of it has the number removed. Um, I was looking at the offender their age and their sex, the victim, their age and their sex, the relationship was was a, a biggest the biggest part of my research, and uh, it, you probably realise that there are a lot of domestic violence incidents and homicides come from them as well. But there are uh, a smattering all over the place, and the only ones that I found that uh, didn't have a recorded homicide in in the last uh, almost two decades was um, uh, same partner relationships. They either very very uh, uh, workable or um, they have the sense to walk away from each other sometimes, but um, there's been no homicides with uh, the same partners, not that I could find anyway. Um, the location of the incident, obviously it's easy to find out where a homicide occurred. It's very hard to find out where the victim was. The time, date, location, um, in those cases where a body was found, where they were located, uh, weapons used, methods of transport, that sort of stuff. All of this puts together to give us a profile of um, the relationships, between the two people and the disposal methods. I also took it one step further in that I went and looked at the height weight disparity to see whether uh, extra height or extra weight had an effect on, on victim disposal. And it turns out, yes, there, there are some uh, great disparities, but most of those related to uh, parents killing their children. So you imagine there's a you know, 50 or 60 kilo disadvantage. There's also a maturity disadvantage, but the majority of them are within you know, 10 or 15 kilos of each other. So there's been no uh, particular advantage to the offender or the victim in, in most incidents. Um, why would I worry about the location and weapons used? Well, obviously the more holes we put in the human body, the quicker they decompose. So if we're looking at someone with a bladed weapon and bladed weapon is, is uh, the weapon of choice in Australia given the, the limited access to firearms. Um, also one punch is uh, uh, on the increase, but if we open up holes, allows uh, insects in, 
and our body decomposes from a SAR point of view, uh, the longer we leave it, the harder it is to actually find the body in any particular environment because uh, once they start to decompose properly, uh, it, it takes a lot of work to actually locate pieces of people. Uh, Jim, we just had a question in, yep. from Ronnie. Um, they just asked if you can elaborate on same partner definition of what that means. Um, from my point of view, I've, I've just looked at them and if it's a, a recorded female and a female partner or recorded male with a male partner, I haven't gone to the extent of of trying to differentiate gender beyond that at all. But uh, I was interested out of all the ones that I had that um, same-sex partnerships didn't figure in homicides at all. Thanks. Uh, I didn't also go down the uh, the route of uh, trying to work out ethnicity at all. So there's no differentiation with uh, Aboriginal people or people who've come to Australia from another country, migrants, um, different backgrounds at all. It's just purely, this is what's happened within Queensland. Um, there may be some differences if we go down to that stage, but uh, on the whole, it seems like we all tend to do pretty much the same thing. Age relationships. Um, has it been a, a, a big identifying factor? No, not really, except where um, an offender has killed their child, then there are great differences there. Most of them are fairly um, close together, as were the relationships between the height and weight, uh, non-familial or familiar relationships. Um, people who are murdered in familiar relationships tend not to be taken as far as those in non-familiar relationships. And I think most of the, the um, homicides that occur within families is done out of passion as opposed to uh, any premeditated thing. And, and uh, once you've done it, the realisation that you have a body to dispose of is... Um, I suppose hard to bear in some cases, but if there's a relationship that is of a familial type, then generally bodies aren't all that far away. Time and date of the incident, obviously middle of the day, very hard to dispose of a body in the back of a ute. Um, so night incidents uh, have a better um, opportunity to dispose of bodies um, and location comes into that as well. Uh, if you kill somebody in the middle of a, a city, much harder to dispose of a body when compared to uh, small country towns or outback. It's also the um, method of transport there. If you don't have a vehicle, uh, it does make it hard. Although there is one incidence of a, uh, a fellow in Queensland here who put his body into, or pieces of his body into um, suitcases and took them on the train to various locations around Brisbane. So it's not insurmountable. It just makes life a little bit difficult. And uh, the method of disposal, that, which was interesting there, are bodies just laid on the ground? Uh, has there been any attempt to cover them? Are they buried? Um, full burials are very, very rare. Shallow graves are fairly common. And by what that I mean is just the depression in the ground. And uh, they put a body in there and covered up with whatever was around. So branches, leaves, a little bit of earth. Um, a lot of times bodies are just placed in, the, uh, in an environment and covered up without any um, trying to hide them at all. And uh, sometimes it's just dumped on the side of the road. Uh, those sort of things there tie really closely with the relationships, so which will contribute to uh, having some dead person behaviour later on. So, as you saw earlier in our lost person behaviour, I'm hoping to have a very similar thing here. And um, what we got here is a husband wife. So I'm sure there will be characteristics which are common to all, tendencies which will be common to all, um, search strategies. Probably not the same strategies we use for a lost person, but there are other strategies we use for unresponsive targets. And uh, I believe that they will be able to translate into looking for homicide victims. The actual search itself, um, you see on TV, they're often with uh, heavy machinery coming in to dig holes, which may or may not be the best strategy. And there have been some uh, experiments with uh, uh, cadavers in the ground to work out um, how shallow graves or how real graves decompose and how we can identify them later on. Uh, a lot of work done with ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity, but uh, the way it is at the moment, um, the Mark One eyeball is probably the best way for us to find a, uh, a homicide victim in the bush. But that'll be the last part of this project will be, can we tighten up our search techniques to better be able to look for shallow or clandestine graves? Validation of any findings? Well, obviously that's a key part of doing a PhD. So when the findings are fully crunched and uh, we get some numbers there, then uh, I will go back and I've been collecting homicide incidents for a long time now. Go back through 
historical ones and ones that have occurred since uh, I started this project to see whether our findings are um, in line with the actual incidents themselves. Um, so far, we've worked out, or it's worked for five times, and uh, five people have been found through our system here. But um, obviously, I'd like a lot more than that, just to prove that what we're doing is, is statistically valid and uh, has some meaning in the way we do things. And another question come through, Jim, yeah. if we can take a moment there. Um, so uh, we've got a question asks, do you think your research could help assist in bringing justice for offenders of killing their victim and disposing of the bodies, making it look like a suicide attempt? Uh, definitely, yes, yes. Um, I'm not a scientist by any means, but there are a lot of ways of determining whether someone died accidentally through suicide, through, uh, through murder. Um, a lot of it comes down to the postmortem. A lot of it comes down to the way the victim was found which uh, as one of the reasons we alluded to before as to why I'm doing this project, finding the victim gives us a, uh, a massive amount of evidence that can, it actually works both ways. It can prove that someone was murdered, but it could also prove in a case that clearly looks like murder that it possibly wasn't. So uh, because it has to be um, apolitical, I suppose, um, scientific examination there can work both ways, but it definitely can uh, assist um, trying to foil someone's uh, attempt at hiding a murder. I'm not saying it works all the time, but um, there's very few cases that uh, have come out that would um, we've we've missed. So actually, a very good point there, because I'm sure some people would have thought about doing that. And would you think you would have a profile for for this, like you did with husband and wife, based on this on the science? Um, I imagine we could. I've never actually looked down that path. That's um, that's probably a little bit of an addendum to what I'm doing, but uh, it's definitely worth looking at. Um, there are a lot of murder-suicides, but uh, I don't recall any of those where an attempt has been made to actually hide the the um, the murder of the person or make it look like a suicide. But I know there there are have uh, there have been a lot of instances where um, the incident looked like a, a suicide, but subsequently was proved not to be. But yeah, it would be very interesting to take this a little bit further and see what we could find. It. I don't think this is ever has an end to it. Like most PhD theses, is, it always leads on to something else. So what I'm hoping to do is have all these findings put into appendix in the National SAR manual after the lost person behavior data that's in there. And that uh, it'll assist search and rescue coordinators in Australia identify areas that are, are worth searching. Um, as I said earlier, it won't be an exact science. It won't say you should search you know, 10 metres from the post and, and three metres to the left. It'll never be like that. But um, at the moment, we've we've worked out there is a, a certain range that people go in and don't go any further. There's um, distances from roadways that we've never had anybody go any further. So the, the searching of a 10,000 hectare paddock in the middle is generally not something that we would do because people just don't carry bodies that far. And unfortunately, literally, uh, a dead person is a natural dead weight. And uh, we are extremely hard to dispose of. Um, have there been times where people have tried to fool us? Yeah, we, we're, there are times where people have uh, ignited a body or tried to cremate it so we couldn't find it. There's been times where people have um, boiled bodies to remove the flesh and then ground up the bones, but uh, people have flushed pieces down the toilets. But uh, it's incredibly hard to dispose of a, a human body. We are um, incredibly resilient. And uh, there's a couple of selected ones that I found that were located as a result of a search. Uh, you probably noticed the first five there, uh, the, um, the, the last victims of uh, Ivan Malat. And uh, initially the first two were found and these ones were found as a result of a search in the area. Daniel Morecambe, well, we searched for seven or eight years for him. And we did a number of searches until ultimately we were given a location. Uh, Nina Lewis, she was murdered and thrown into the Brisbane River. Uh, Jolene Mills, killed by her husband. Alison baden a very famous one where she was taken 11 kilometres away and just dumped. Stephanie Strott, sad lady who was murdered just before her wedding. And Jade Kendall was murdered after a, a date. But all of those people were found as a result of a search because we looked at the data and were able to say, given the relationship and that, um, they could be found within this sort of distance. 
And we had a couple of questions come in about your data for your, yep. your research. On um, the first one, thank you for your an interesting and informative topic. Um, with your analysis and your data, has that been used in other states? And also, have you been able to use it as a backup in court? Uh, it has been used in other states. Um, it's, it's worked five times and it worked half a time, but uh, I got the distance wrong in that case, but the disposal area was okay. It has been used five times. Um, I don't believe any of these court, uh, instances have gone to court yet, um, but it could be the case where uh, I might have to get up in court and provide how we got the evidence to get there. Um, I do that often in land searches anyway as to why we determine where to search for those sort of people. But um, I, I suppose there would become a day where it would have to be tested legally, um, although it, it's only a tool in amongst the thousand tools that we would use for a homicide. Um, so locating the body, uh, could they allude to the fact that we knew where the body was, so therefore we're part of the party to the crime? I don't know, but um, yeah, I would look forward to that day because I think it would be an interesting tussle within a court system to show that this actually does work, which I believe it does. Thanks. And the uh, other question from James, uh, when validating your research, are you using existing field search coordinators or do you have a special group of officers focusing on, the, on that topic? No, I have, uh, I have a fairly wide range of SAR coordinators within Queensland covering land, marine and aviation. And uh, as they do their jobs um, throughout the state, then I use the data that they collect. So we don't actually have a, a cold homicide SAR group at all. Um, it, because Queensland is such a large place, we use people of, of opportunity wherever the incident occurs. So I, I suppose in that respect, it'll give it a little bit more validity and that we're not um, predisposing our SAR coordinators to look for a particular thing. Um, I think that's uh, about where we can go for that one. Thanks, that's it for now. So that's about where we are. Um, has it helped us at all? Yes, it has. Uh, is it an ongoing assistance for it? Yes, it is with the, the law changes that say if there's no body, there's no parole. And uh, there are some people in jail at the moment who uh, are in there because we have no body. So often we go back and look at those cases. But I suppose, I suppose it's a, a very niche area, um, one that's not considered very much. But I think if you were one of the families that uh, had a victim that was, we believe, murdered and has never been found, then uh, this might be something that you would be hoping would work so that we could return uh, a loved one into your own care. But anyway, thank you very much for, for spending the time listening. Thanks. We have a, another couple of questions that have yeah. come through. Um, the first one, um, so Rachel's asked, in cases like Julie Hutchinson, who was killed by her husband and he would not say where the body was, would this system help with that? Um, and she said, if she recalls correctly, that her body was accidentally found. That's correct, yeah. Uh, we did searches for those. We do searches for most homicide victims. Uh, at the end of the day, that one there, it, it would have fitted within our parameters. Um, she, she was found accidentally, I, I believe, through a fire through a property. Um, she was found in the grass there. So she was within the distance from a road and she was in the right direction. But as you can imagine, um, it probably would uh, include several different roads, uh, several areas to search. So it's never gonna be exactly perfect, but it would have put us on the track and it would have identified areas that um, we would probably not bother searching because that just wouldn't fit into the equation. And then uh, Stephen says that uh, he's working as a field, in the field of lost person behavior for lost tourists. Do you expect that there could be a crossover between your work and live person searches? Oh, definitely. Um, oh, because I do live person searches anyway, um, there's definitely a crossover. And I believe that the strategies we use now um, with slight modification could be included to search for basically any target as long as we have the data that would make it valid. Another question. Uh, Matthew Levison is a person who was murdered by his same-sex partner. His body was found when his partner told the police where he was for immunity. I'm not sure um, where that was, but that's no, a comment. I'd, it must be, uh, well, I'm not going to stick my neck out and say it wasn't in Queensland because it had happened before 2004, I wouldn't have noticed it, but it could have been another one. Um, I'm just, and I did open my mouth, that I'm pretty certain the ones that I've done in Queensland don't have same-sex partners, but I'm happy to be proven wrong. Uh, and then another another uh, comment here from Daryl. If the research speeds up the process of finding a victim, I know a lot of SES members will be happy. So thanks for all your hard work from Daryl. Um, that's a really valid point too, because as I said, the longer we leave it, the, 
the harder it is to find them, but the more yucky uh, um, victims are to find. And uh, any SES person would attest to the fact that whether they were murdered or just died because of um, exposure or hypothermia, it, it, you can't unsee that sort of stuff. So um, if we can save it, then that's perfect. Thanks, and then uh, one other question. Uh, what's the most interesting case or crime scene that you've experienced in your time? I think off the top of my head, it would be um, when Heather Edgerton was located. She she was killed in the thrill killing at Mount Lindsay in 1990, and her body was found 19 kilometres away. Um, sadly for her, because she was just up there taking pictures of Mount uh, Mount Lindsay, um, and there's just one of those ones that was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But uh, I, I think every single one of them, and I don't go to them all because that's that's not my particular job now. Let's make sure the system works. I think any any one of them there is is worthy of uh, you know regardless of who you are it's, it's a sad time and and uh, should be recognised by everybody. No one chooses to be murdered, I'm sure. No, I think that goes back to your point where every every even if there's five to twelve in a year, that's they're, they're all important and they're all unique. So they are, Thank and you. Yeah. You know, when you look at every murder victim, you know there's probably twenty or thirty connections to them, friends, family. Then it's a lot of people over a, a long period of time. Thanks, I don't have any other questions here um, for you from anyone. So I think that um, it concludes it, uh, if you don't have any other slides. No, that's it, thank you very much. All right, well, sure, thanks, sure, everybody. Sure. thanks everybody for attending our webinar this evening. And uh, again, thank you to you, Jim, for speaking this evening and sharing that with us. Um, I wanna ask everyone to please complete our post webinar survey um, tonight to provide your feedback and suggestions. So that a link will open in your browser when the webinar concludes. Um, and then as you can see, our next webinar will be held on the 22nd of July at 7 p.m. And there'll be our J JCU in careers, uh, sorry, JCU careers in health webinar that will be um, playing as well.